J.T. Crowley is talking books. On this show, you'll hear from emerging talent and seasoned veterans from around the world. Hello, I'm J.T. Crowley, the host of Talking Books show on Web Talk Radio. And today I'm really looking forward to chatting to Peter Boas Jones from the Birmingham area of the United Kingdom to talk about his book, The Gospel of the Fall, which is a unique conflation of the four Gospels into a single continuous narrative explicated by the author's commentary. What's the book about? Hmm. Well, let's find out by directly asking the author himself, what's it about? So I'm going to ask Peter to come and join me. Peter, come and join me on the show. Hello. Peter, um, before we get into the book, could you tell the audience a little bit about who you are and why you formulated this book and what's going to be revealed in the book? Right. Um, well, uh, obviously, I'm Peter Bowers Jones. I came over from Germany in 1948. Um, it's been a mission of mine from a teenager. Um, studying um and really the, the the book is just a way of looking at things afresh because there's many there seems to be many contradictions with uh, some scholars and i've just spent my time smoothing things out and giving explanations as to why and trying to make it simpler for the, for the um, person who likes to look a bit deeper. Yeah. So you, your book is, um, you're trying to make the four Gospels a little simpler for people, you know, to bring them together in a kind of um, unification. Yes, yes. Because there, there, there's so many um, different points of view. See, the, the basic thing is, the message of the, of, the, of the four Gospels is sim very simple. But the problem comes when people start saying, this says this, this says that. And, okay, in all innocence, they, they do it. But, really, to understand more, one needs to go into it a little bit deeper. Um... That that's what I was trying to get across, you know. Okay, let's have a look at the book. Um, now, everybody, there are fifty-four chapters to this book, so we're not going to dip our toes into all fifty-four chapters because that's not the purpose of the podcast. Uh, the purpose is to give you a flavour of what this book is about. This amazing book. So, we're going to go to eight chapters, which we um, we feel best reflect the overriding context of the book the gospels of four so the first chapter i want to go to peter is chapter two the annunciations and here i find you talking about two conceptions those being of john the baptist and jesus the messiah and you have some very interesting topical views incorporated here, particularly the concept that Jesus was received, conceived at Christmas, not born. And, and you also float the idea that his birth was probably in the autumn, the following autumn. Please enlighten us as to where you're taking the reader here with these two conceivements. Well, you can understand the church from the beginning when we go back to, uh, say, uh, 300 AD when most people couldn't read and write and the calendar had just come into force with the church trying to make the calendar simple for, for the people who couldn't read and write. And eventually people did start to read and write. And... Obviously, we were left with Christmas being on the 25th, the day Jesus was born. 
but one can't blame the church because the church was trying to show the people in them those days an, an aspect of it which was very difficult to um, explain in writing. Anyway, they could, they, you know, they, they couldn't read and write. Most people couldn't read and write. So therefore, um, looking into it deeper, and the church must have known this anyway, um, but it wasn't something they could get across simply to the average person. So that's how we came with, you know, Jesus being born on Christmas Day. But when one goes deeper into it, one can see, even from um, the Jewish aspect, that Jesus was... Um, born during tabernacles, the festival of tabernacles, um, which was September, which is normally September to October. Um, so therefore, you know, we go back nine months and sort of um, try and understand that the conception to enlighten people today is more, more um, how can I say, more profound than being born. Though one can't take out of being, you know, being born, um, and all, all, all along, that that premise was there all, all, all the time. I mean, it even says that Jesus is the Son of uh, Righteousness, um, S U N. Um, so the, the, these things I've put in that chapter there to try and make it simpler for people to understand. And many, many, many people really know this now. It's becoming more common. Um, so, you know, I just try to help in that vein, you know. Yeah. And the conception of uh, John the Baptist? Yeah, the, the conception was six months before Jesus. So um, the angel Gabriel spoke to um, uh, his wife, Elizabeth, in June because... Uh, John, he was in. He was under the court, the, the course, the course of uh, um, doing things in the temple, which was uh, the sixth month, which anybody can check, which was June. So, I think it was three months later. I, I haven't got this in front of me. Three months later, Gabriel spoke to um, Mary and said, "Jesus would be." Um, uh, Jesus would be born. Well, Jesus was being conceived, but he would be born, uh, you know, later on. Obviously, nine months later. Uh, and those dates, if you check those dates, you, you can see exactly how, um, you know, it's the fact that Jesus was born six months after John the Baptist was born. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Interesting views there. Wouldn't you agree, everybody? Yeah. Let's move along to um, chapter five. Um. And I found this uh, very, very interesting. And it's really, it's, it's the story around Jesus prepares for his mission. Um, and I found that it's a, you know, this is a turning point, this chapter is in the book. And you're focusing on Jesus' baptism here. And the temptations Jesus encountered in the desert after his baptism, you know, in the desert, he's out in the wilderness. And of course, we've got the 40 days. And of course, in I totally understand that the number 40 is very significant in the Bible. You know, the 40 days of Lent and then the 40 days after Easter for Pentecost. 40 is quite significant. Um, and you reference all the Gospels here. So my question to you is, Peter, how important is this chapter and why are you talking to the reader about the events within, like the temptation from the devil, you know, Satan, while Jesus was in the wilderness. Talk to us about this chapter. Yeah. Um, well, um, just trying to figure out where to start. Um, yeah, we start we start with Jesus' baptism, which, if one checks, one can see that it was actually on the day of Pentecost, which was in in June. Um, and uh, it was the time for Jesus to start preaching the gospel. Uh, before then, he may have, you know, I mean, he, he was 30, well, 30 years old when he started preaching. But I mean, he, obviously he did things before that, but it's not actually written, it's not actually written you know. So, um, and Jesus came from Galilee, 
uh, which a lot of people don't realise. It was a Gentile, that was a Gentile area. Uh, and a lot of people think, oh, Jesus only spoke to the Jews, you know. Uh, but the fact is, if one checks in my book, one can see that Jesus spoke more times to, to Galilee, to the Gentiles and Samaria, and even, even other places that were Gentile, than he did to the Jews. Uh, in fact, Jesus had four missions to the Gentiles uh, through, through his three-and-a-half-year ministry, and uh, three to, to, the, to the Jews of Judea and Jerusalem. So obviously Jesus spoke more to the Gentiles than he did to the Jews mainly because he was Jewish anyway, and, you know, one should understand, uh, you know, where he was coming from. But so so for, from Pentecost, when he um, passed, if you like, passed an examination, he, he proved that, you know, he, he could uh, uh, withstand the devil, so to sort of speak. He was ready then to, pre to preach the gospel, but he didn't preach the gospel until actually in September, um, so we had the 40 days added on to uh, Pentecost, um, which you we know, which, which got June, July, August. Um, and of course, uh, I, I haven't figured exactly the exact, um, after the 40 days, because he doesn't actually say what happened after the 40 days, other than Jesus went to a, uh, well, he actually does. He said Jesus went to a wedding, did his first miracle. And um, I believe is the wedding at Cana, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. And then eventually started preaching his gospel after that, after the first miracle, when he left Nazareth and came to live in Capernaum, you know, which is in the same, uh, in the same Galilee region. Oh, it um, is. It's on the shores. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we can see there a preparation. Uh, and of course, um, you know, we mentioned 40 days, 40 days in the wilderness with the, uh, with the 12 tribes in, the, in Moses' time. Um, yes, it's all linked together, 40 days. It's, it, 40 days is a trial to, to see if you can go on to the next stage properly. It was a test. It was a temptation. You know, would he... Um survive the temptations from you know from the devil yeah yeah um you know uh being out in the wilderness but when you look at it being, when he was saying out in the wilderness he was probably just outside the you know the, the city yes yeah, you right. go to jerusalem and you go to israel everything is very close to um you know it was just around the corner a lot of these things yeah, yeah. certainly in jerusalem it was yeah because uh, i've been there twice and you tend to think when you read the Bibles, everyone, that, oh, it's miles away. It's not. It's just around mm -hmm. the corner. Mm -hmm. It was just up the hill. It was just down the road. Mm -hmm. Because you have to bear in mind that, well, they didn't have any transport, apart from the odd donkey. Mm -hmm. um, so they didn't walk far. Um, yeah. But yes, but 40 is very, very significant in the Bible. And... And, of course, the baptism, again, is very symbolic as well. So this is what this chapter um, 5 is about, everybody. It's the start of Jesus' mission. Because when you also think about it, I'm thinking right here, Peter, he was, we believe he was 30 at the time. So he was a relatively old man in those days. Yeah, John, John the Evangelist, who wrote the Revelation as well and wrote the, the most intimate parts in the Gospels about Jesus, he could remember, you know, virtually nearly yeah. everything. Um, I mean, he went on to live on the Isle of Patmos. Uh, he was ostracized, ostracized from you know, by the Romans, by the Roman Empire. Um, I mean, he lived. He he, he was in his nineties, you know. So, mm. so you know, I, I see what you mean. Yeah. yeah, it's what they call a, what what was a year in those days. What we have a year now is slightly different. Everyone now. Yeah. I want to move on, Peter, to chapter 8. And here is, we've got the journey from Galilee to Jerusalem. It's a powerful chapter, everybody. Here we have Jesus with his disciples escaping Nazareth from, to go to Capernaum. The miracle of the unclean spirits from a local man on the Sabbath. And of course, this is very important. It's mentioned on the Sabbath. On the Sabbath... 
in the Jewish religion, you do nothing in those days. So to be doing something like this was controversial. That's the whole point. And you're talking about the first Passover, the Sermon Up the Mount. Um, blessed are the needy. Blessed are the humble, etc., etc. So what's the underlying tone of your conversation here that you're trying to get across to the, the reader and the audience here? What are you trying to tell us? Well, basically, um, the Sabbath day, is, it, it, it should be a day of rejoicing. So therefore, you know, any, any restrictions on the Sabbath day contradicts rejoicing. It's a day of creation. It was the day of creation. So it should be a day, a day of create, creativity. Um, but, you know, which, which, which shows the, uh, the, the man who was healed on the Sabbath day. Um, and not, yeah. Uh, so basically, basically I'm, I was, I'm trying to, to show that um, whether Jesus, you know, preached in Jerusalem or Samaria or Galilee, um, the same message went to both Jews and Gentiles. Um, I mean, sometimes it puts the Jews in a bad light, you know, the, the, the Gospels. Um, but we have to realise that many times Jesus was talking to a few in the hierarchy. And most of the times, the Jews, the common Jews, loved Jesus. They loved his miracles, they, you know. Uh, and then they wanted to try and understand what he was saying. So, that, you know, that... that some Christians seem to, they, they have a go at Jews in the sense um, the Jews don't understand things, and you know. But so I'm, I'm just trying to get across there, really, uh, to bridge the gap between Gentiles and Jews, uh, that, you know, we're all the same. And it's the message that counts of what Jesus is saying. Yes, I, I, yeah, I understand that. And of course... When we look at the biblical scriptures and say the unclean spirit, um, we've got to bear in mind that in those days they were simple folks. He was talking to very simple folks. That's why he talked to them in parables. Sim parables they understood because to talk to them, you know, highfalutin, they wouldn't have got any the message and it would go straight over their heads and have been a waste of time. And you probably think, I don't know if you agree with me here, Peter, that this man was probably somebody who had epilepsy. Yeah, there is that. Uh, I believe it's a combination. Um, I, um, I do believe that, 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 that there are angels who... The, prob the problem is a lot of people blame the devil and he's and his angels because he's he's got angels as well yeah um and really uh, there's a lot of mistranslation um about the devil um uh, mainly because it's in old english and translators have tried to um make it fit, fit uh, make it make it fit with the um, ideals of the day but one when one checks thoroughly one can see that the devil is just He's good, you know. It's just his job. His job is to. It's like when you go to court, you got the for and against, and the truth tries to come out, and that's all the job of the devil is really. Uh, he, he's on the um, the prosecution side, um, though a lot of people would disagree with that because you know they they, they quote um, you know the, the various translations and, but. Yeah, you, going back to your original question, um, the point is this, uh, another thing, you see, most Jews can read and write, you see, because they were the first ones who could read and write in the sense that they went to the synagogue, went to the shul, you know, every week. So they were head, they were like blooming before anybody else in that sense, because they could read and write. Um, so when Jesus spoke to the Jews, they knew exactly what he was saying. Though some of the uh, more educated ones, scribes and the Pharisees, you know, didn't 
you can't blame them all, but you know, quite a few. You know, they they couldn't they didn't understand when he was speaking simply you know, in 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 analogies like parables. Um, but that is to do with the uh, the ignorance of being educated and not knowing why you're educated, you know, and forgetting why you're you're educated. But um, yeah, going back to the the spirit uh, thing. Um, yeah, I, I, I believe both. Um, uh, but it's not fashionable today to say somebody's possessed. You know, I mean, we're all possessed by something. You know, um, whether it's good or bad. Um, and uh, that's the way I, I, I look at it. I, I think you know, I believe it's true. Um, but it, that's another subject, and to, you know, to, to get into um, the spirits and the, the devil and all that uh, is um, is really another subject, you know. Yeah. Oh, it is, everyone. It is. Now, I want to give you an overriding flavour of the book, everybody. So I'm going to skip to the middle of the book here. Um, so let's take the audience and the reader, the listener, uh, to chapter 29, which you head up, hypocrisy of some of the hierarchy. Mm. Here we have Jesus dining with the Pharisees. Mm. And you mention leaven of the Pharisees. You mention the rich fool and so on to talk about discernment and attitude. And when I looked at this chapter, I thought, hmm. Now, for me, the leaven of the uh, the Pharisees and the area around discernment and attitude, I found enlightening. But would you care to tell the audience a little bit more about this part of the book and why these four key areas that you have talked about in this chapter are put there? What the are you trying to say to the reader? Did you say four key areas? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you'd have to refresh my memory then. <laughs> With, uh, we've got the rich fool. Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah. Um, you know, we've got Jesus dining with the Pharisees, and, and you're talking about discernment and attitude. Yeah, right. Well, well um, putting them all together as one, um, we see that Jesus all, always had the audience of the Pharisees and the scribes and the Pharisees throughout the Gospels. Now, this means that they they were interested, but some of them were wary, because later on you could see that they thought that they, they thought they were going to lose their jobs uh, if they went along, along with, with what Jesus was saying. Um, and it, it, it's it's typical for today. I mean. Um, I believe God. I believe our governments are, are, are absolutely great and good. And because when you go in Jesus' time, they they was coping with what was going on at the time with the Romans being in charge. Um, and we can see that there's a likeness between today and. But so, some would say, "Oh, there you are. Our governments are bad and all this." But well, one one checks. It's it's only always a couple couple in the government and because the Pharisees that was the government the Pharisees were, were, were the government of, of uh, Judea um, so without pointing fingers at anybody um, Jesus dines with the Pharisee to show that even Pharisees are good without the Pharisees we, we, we wouldn't have um, uh, the New Testament anyway uh, which is another debate but what I'm trying to say is that um, even those that Jesus was having a go at, which which he didn't really name, um, and we can see this at the at, at the crucifixion. Um, a lot of people think, "Oh, it's the Jews crucified Jesus," when actually it was the Romans. You know, okay, the Romans um, allowed the Jews to uh, have their way. But it wasn't the Jews, the whole Jews nation. It was only a few who, a couple at the top, had gathered a mob to say, crucify this man. He's, you know, we, we'll pay you to say it. The hypocrisy yeah, of the hierarchy. Yeah. The yeah. hypocrisy of the hierarchy. Yeah. And of course, Jesus dined with lots of people, didn't he? Matthew, yeah, the right. tax collector. 
Yeah. Um, which they struggled, you know, to understand. Yeah, so, I could, I could uh, uh, dine with the, high, the hierarchy, you know. But, oh yeah, <laughs> I, and because uh, I I love the bits, you know. Sometimes I know I'm going off a bit of a tangent here, but when um, the Pharisees and the scribes uh, were trying to trick him with the coin, and they said, "There's a picture of Caesar there," and he turns around, he knows exactly what they were trying to do, and he says, "Pay to Caesar what is owed to Caesar, and pay to the God what you know to to the Lord, what is due to the Lord." Now they weren't expecting that answer. They were hoping to say something totally different. They were trying to trick him, but he was one step ahead of them. He always was one step ahead of them. Right. And that's what they didn't like. That's what the, the hierarchy didn't like. Mm. That he was a threat to them, to their mm. position in society. Because they were very legalistic, of course. You know, being, oh, yes. yes. Not being the lawyers, um, they're very, um, they would accept a good answer, but some answers... You, you, you can't, um, how can I say, it, it, it just leaves everything blank, some answers. Uh, but they were waiting for an answer to, they knew the answer really. It's just that, as you say, they were, they were tricking, trying to trick him up, you say. And, oh, that was them. Yeah. And it's, and it's a bit like um, he was talking to them that when you went into the temple or you went to a feast you know, and you sat at the front, because that's where they liked to sit. They thought they were important. And but the message of that little story was because yes, sir, they were sat at the front at the wedding in the guest table, but the um, but then to be asked to sit to the back, well, of course that would be um, highly embarrassing, and then moving somebody from the back up to the front, he was trying to tell them a message there. Uh, yes, you you turn up in all your fine robes. But it's what's inside is more important. Yes, absolutely. Yes, mm. absolutely. Now, Peter, the kingdom of God is such a powerful and significant issue on its own. Never mind fitting it into your book. But this is exactly what you have done. Devoted the chapter 34 to this, to the kingdom of God. I find you talking about the 10 lepers aspects of the kingdom and you reference the gospel writer Luke quite a bit in this chapter. You have more headings like Luke relates to Matthew with Mark, um, they continue to proceed again and trusting materialism. What are you trying to get at here in this chapter? Well, um, especially the 10 lepers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's quite symbolic in many ways because we we, we had the ten the ten the ten lost tribes um, who disappeared into history. Where there's debate, you know, where they are and all this, but um, uh, and that they the ten tribes they they didn't want the the they, they wanted their own throne, their own throne for their kingdom. Uh, when whatever you say, the throne belonged to Judah. The Jews, um, even though they, you know, they made mistakes, still it was supposed to be there. Um, now, um, the Samaritans, being in the area of Samaria as well, which was a Gentile area, uh, where obviously the Pharisees used to go, you know, all over Israel, but um, uh, there, there, there is a symbolism there, and at the end of the day, the symbolism is to help your neighbour. Which, when we talk about the kingdom of God, um, a lot of people don't understand the kingdom of God is here now, or within. A lot of people say like within, which it is as with. It's, it's within and here. It's how we, how we as a people, uh, uh, countries, how we try and function the kingdom of God on the earth. Because it's you could you know the Lord's prayer is your will be done on earth the kingdom of God so um, and a lot of people there's very a lot of um, strange religious people but they try and dissect it from they try and say oh the kingdom of God is, uh, it's not now but the whole point that Jesus was saying was the kingdom of God is now it's not only within it's how you treat your neighbour 
how even politi- the point I think even a lot of politicians know all these things and, and they go by them um, and but the, you know the point is is making sure you keep you stick to it so that you give the you know the king, you give the kingdom of God a chance to grow which in some aspects it is growing um, other people would disagree with that and they would say well you know the way the world seems to be at the moment um, but we've got to look at it as helping our neighbour and that's it um, but that's the way and of course you know Jesus did say my kingdom is not of this earth no not of the way of the but yeah it, it it, it's a continuous process, which is, who knows, you know, where, 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 how it's going to... Um, it, oh, indeed. I mean, who it is knows? positive. It's going to be in a positive way. So that's all we can say, really. Yeah. Now, when I look at your book, I, I have got to go to Chapter 43, everybody. And it's The Last Supper. That's what it's headed up as. And, of course... You know, the Last Supper is synonymous to most people who have a faith, a background uh, with uh, Maundy Thursday, uh, Easter type. But the most important time, and because Easter for a lot of the Christian churches is the most um, relevant, important liturgical time of the year, far more than Christmas, far more. And here, Peter, I find you talking about the first day, the Passover. Now, the Passover is very, very important. You talk about the betrayer and the first toast. And you talk about the betrayer revealed. And again, you draw upon a cross section of the Gospels. So my question to you is, what do you want the reader to take away from your writings here? Well, the... um... Really, I want the reader to understand the the Jewish significance of the uh, of Easter, even though Christmas is more, as you say, more well, Christmas is more popular. It's more enjoyed, even if you talk to people who claim have nothing to do with religion or God. They always love Christmas. So, in one sense, we could say Christmas is you know better than Easter, but Easter. Is really the the formulation of eternal life. That it's the, it points to the resurrection when our physical fleshly bodies are are portrayed of eventually becoming spiritual, the spirit being resurrected, like Jesus was resurrected, uh, and when he was resurrected, though he appeared the same. Uh, he, 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 though he appeared to have a physical body, it wasn't physical. So the message is for, for everybody. I mean, I mean, a lot of people are busy at work and they haven't got time to, to um, consider uh, that, that they want to be any different. It's like the Eucharist. I mean, um, we have this, and people go whenever they want to, really, to... Uh, uh, have the blood and the wine, which is a sim- symbolic. Um, but w- when we see the Gospels, really, um, it, it's, it is a festival, it's a feast. And it's a feast of joy as well, festival of joy. Um, and we see that, you know, it lasted for seven day, over seven days. Um, so that's how important it was in them days. Um, and still is if you want to if you want to make it important you can you've got the choice of um remembering the passover uh and and, and remembering easter at the same time you know, one doesn't block the other out it's it's just a different way for different people to understand but those who want to go a bit deeper can see the significance of as we say we we we, we live at eleven the days of unleavened bread, uh, which really are the days of no yeast in the bread, you see. So, so when we go back to the hypocrisy of the uh, the leaven of the Pharisees, uh, Jesus was saying, we don't want any puffed up people, you know, we, we don't want any uh, over-bigged people thinking they're great, you know, when they, just, when they should be humble. 
Um, so all this fit, fit, yeah. That was Jesus telling the Pharisees and the scribes in particular, you might see yourselves as better than them, but you're not. Everybody's equal. That was the message. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And of course, the number seven, again, is a significant number in the Bible. That's right, yeah. Day of, yeah, day of creation. Um, yeah, the creation. Of, yeah, yeah these type. Yeah, seven was a very significant number, yeah, yeah. like 40. Yeah. Um, let's go to uh, your chapter around um, the Mount of Olives and Gethsemane. Now, they are famous landmarks in and around Jerusalem in Israel. So you give chapter 45 the title Mount Olives and Gethsemane. And within that chapter, you highlight six areas of stunning subject matters. They are the purpose of the spirit, their sorrows turn to joy, three prayers before Gethsemane, the move to Gethsemane, three prayers in Gethsemane, and the 42nd miracle, Malchus E. Malchus's ear. And now, if you ever go to Jerusalem, you think, oh, where's Mount Olives and Gethsemane? It was just outside of the old city. You just, there is the mount. As you walk out the city, it's across the way. And the, the garden of Gethsemane, everybody, is just a part of it down towards the bottom. So it's all again within walking distance. Um... So, but what I want to ask here, Peter, is talk to me about the prayers you include here. That's what I'm trying to get across to this. The prayers in Gethsemane, the prayers beforehand. Yeah. Um, they, they, just come out, they just come out of the upper room. They, they just uh, kept the Passover in the uh, upper room. Um, they'd had quite a bit of wine as well. Uh, that's why I was tired. It's really quick. Been, been late at night as well. But... Um, um, and because not only did there was a one toast, there seemed to be in Judaism we have, we had have four toasts. But as I say, I, I haven't looked to see that. All I know is that there was more than one toast in in, in the Gospels. You, you know, you can see for yourself. Um, and of course, Jesus Jesus knew he was going to be betrayed. Um, so. It was like he he was walking to his grave. I mean, he he knew that in, in the next few hours he he was going to be arrested, and in the morning, you know, crucified. Um, so it, it was a heavy, it was a heavy moment because, in one way, he didn't have to do that. He, he could have said, "Well, we said to the father that let this cop pass away if if he can be." Uh, but it's not not, not uh, my will, he, uh, but the Father's will. So it was a heavy thing um, for him to go through. And because he was trying to teach his disciples the importance of prayer and uh, positive thinking, and he, as he goes from the, the upper room, um, he goes to get, he goes towards Gethsemane, and he says three prayers. With the disciples on the Mount of Olives before he even gets to Gethsemane, and then he gets to Gethsemane, and because they're dropping, you know, they're, they're, they're going to sleep basically. Um, he says three prayers to the Father and asks asks them to to wait, you know, uh, or to watch, as he says, watch, because Jesus knew the Rome, the um, the Pharisees uh, soldiers were coming. To arrest him, you see. So he had three pray three prayers before being arrested, and as, as he was um, just closing the last prayer, he said, "Oh, Judas is here with his um, with the soldiers," and um, Peter, being you know, obviously woke up at that time because of the um, they could hear the soldiers coming, and you know the uh, what was going on, and. Um, Peter, not being the impetuous as, as he's pictured, cut, you know, cut the ear off um, Malchus. Um, 
which to my calculations was the 42nd miracle. Um, 42 is very symbolic as well, as well as, well as 40. Uh, you have 42 months that Jesus preached the gospel, three and a half years. You've got three and a half years in Revelation, uh, book of Revelation. Um, so that's quite symbolic. Uh, and of course, Jesus healed the ear straight away. It reminded me, I'm after Donald Trump at the moment. <laughs> so, we won't go there. <laughs> so, um, you know, so it, it, it's um, it's a beautiful setting of the prayers with the disciples and the prayers that Jesus spoke to the Father, um, which teaches us that we must always be, you know, watchful, um, ready, and have the mindset of continuous prayer. Uh, I see. Now, the last chapter I want to go to, you know, in the final section of the book, um, is chapter 51. As I said, there are 54 chapters. And if you want to know more about all the chapters, well, simply, I just have to say this, go and buy the book. Um, but, you know, the idea here of this interview is just to give you a brief flavour, a sneak preview of what is in the book. So I want to go to the last chapter that we're going to go to. And it's headed up, Jesus fulfills um, scripture, because this is what it's about. It's a short chapter, but a very significant one. And you have two topical areas of note here. All the women tell the apostles and the Messiah, the first fruit. Why have you set this chapter like this and why the Gospel of Luke here? We're in the 40 days between his resurrection and his ascension into heaven. So why the two topical areas, women tell the apostles and the Messiah, the first fruit? Well, it's quite interesting uh, that, uh, I mean, it just the text just follows on there. It's a, it's a continuation of the text, basically, um, in a successive order. Um, and because we come to the point where um, uh, Jesus is being, Jesus has been resurrected, and you got the message from the two angels, um, though one gospel says one angel, but one can check on that in the book. Uh, that the two angels tell the women at the um, by the um, where Jesus is buried. Who? Yeah, where Jesus is buried. That he's resurrected, and of course they look into the tomb, and there's nothing, nothing there except the the clothes that um, he was wearing at the time. Shroud, yeah. Um, and then we got the successive things after that, but uh, but but coming to the the, the point, um, I believe there's a very strong point there. A lot of people believe that when Jesus was saying that um, he was going to heaven, that he was talking about himself being the first fruit of the resurrection. And of course, he says to Mary, don't, don't touch me. I haven't ascended to the Father. So we see there, if we, we study deeper, that while he was speaking to Mary... And when you say Mary, that's Mary Magdalene, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not Mary, his mother. No, 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 no. no. Mary Magdalene. She, she was part of the, the, the crowd that... that uh, yeah. Uh, went to the tomb, um, yeah, Mary Magdalene, and um, which is symbolic as well, because instead of uh, Jesus appearing to Peter, one would have thought it would, it, it would appear to Peter first, because being the, well, as I say, the chief apostle. Um, the successor. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it appeared to a woman who was supposed to have seven, uh, who were healed with uh, having seven... Uh, Lifestyle, yeah, of seven bad spirits. <laughs> so, so she was very close to him, and uh, she she understood. But so he appeared to the to, to to a woman first, which was anathema, you know, in in, in, in the, hier the hierarchy of the uh, Pharisees, because um, a woman should be you know in their place. You know, so, so anyway, he, he appeared to Mary first, and he says, "Don't touch me." Don't handle me. I'm about to appear, uh, go to the Father, you see. Now, it's, it's quite hard to understand if one hasn't done a bit of studying. Um, 
And a lot of people say, oh, well, he, you know, he, he's talking about when he goes to heaven later, you say. But if one looks closer, to fulfill the, the, um, the part of the first fruit, in the, uh, in the festival of Tabernacle, uh, of uh, Unleavened Bread, we find that on the Sunday, which is the day after the weekly Sabbath, there was um, a ceremony where they cut the first sheaf. They cut a sheaf, just one sheaf of um, corn. Uh, and in the ceremony, elevated it, offered it to, to um, God in symbolism. Mm. So that fits exactly there with Jesus going back to the Father for, for probably the morning, whole morning, because it was early morning anyway, and coming back to Peter at the start of the afternoon, which was the second uh, second appearance, Mary's was the first, um, and the symbolism of that, you see, um, that, 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 that Jesus fulfilled everything in detail that needed to be fulfilled. Um, to give us a lesson to see that these things couldn't have been made up, you know, <laughs> that somebody couldn't have made all these things up. Um, and for the fact that there's four separate gospels, um, also, I believe there was one gospel originally, um, and it was Jesus who told the apostles what to what to write down in their version in their versions. Um, and that's why we see we, we, the 42 miracles are actually signs to keep everything joined together. So, you, so if one's studying, one can see that was that first miracle took part there, and that you know, and then the third miracle in that area, and that joined together that, those verses. And there were signs um, for us to to understand. Um, and of course, um, how can I say? Um, some say, oh, there's only 37 miracles. You know, uh, this is always debatable for people to, to to really study, to find you know, to find out themselves. That's why I believe my book is handy for that. You see, and people can make up their own mind. Um, yeah, and uh, as I say, that is a short chapter, but it's very poignant. It is. As I say before uh, after the resurrection mm. and for what is yet to come. It is. Um, so, who would you like to see reading your book? Who did you? Well, everybody, to... obviously, you know. I'm saying, everybody who's um, on their way to a religious inclination, um, but also the, the people who have studied it. Um, and I always say, the people who have studied it, there must be very a lot of answers on un, unanswered questions for them. Because I know I've, you know, I've been through it. So, uh, and on the conception of the book, my, my solicitor said to me, who are you writing the book for, Mr. Jones? I said, well, I, I'm writing it for everybody. But in one way, I've written it for scholars. I'd say they, they might not like that. And I, but I hope that, that they're humble enough to at least have a look. Some of them have had a look and said uh, disparand, you know, disparand, can't say the word, disparandly, disparandly words, you know. Um, but that just makes it all the better in the sense for the average person, the average religious person, to check up, to study. Don't just believe always what you've always believed. Though yeah. the, central message, the central message is, is, is important. But if you want to go a little bit further, there, that's why my book is there, you know. It is. It's a book, everybody. So if you've got any spirit, spiritual inclinations and want to find a little bit more in depth about the the Gospels, you know, the four Gospels, then go and have a look at Peter's book, because that's really what it's about. And he takes you on an incredible journey across the four Gospels, which an awful lot of authors do as well. Um, do you tend to write any more books? Uh, not at the moment. I, mean, I, I, I have been asked to, but um, no, this is a work that is continuous. Um, it, it, it'll go on forever, um, in the sense of um, it never. You know, it's not something that you read and then that's it. You're ready. You, you use it forever. You know. Um, no, at the moment, because uh, I'm still, you know, working on it in the sense of uh, 
you know, marketing it. Um, and it keeps me busy talking about it as well. And talking um, about marketing, where can people get your book from? Uh, well, they, they can get it from Facebook. Uh, they get it from uh, Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble. Um, I'm just trying to think where else. Um, Publishers? Yeah, the publisher themselves, the author house. Also, um, uh, Twitter or X. Um, yeah, it's, it's a, if one just puts the, the, the uh, my name in and the, and the, and the title, it, it'll come up there on, on Google. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Excellent. There you go, everyone. Yeah. Um, it's predominantly it, it will be on Amazon, everybody, and uh, the publisher's um, uh, bookstore site. All I have to say is, Peter Boas Jones, thank you very much for giving me the wonderful opportunity of chatting to you and interviewing you, you know, and having a brief conversation over the last few weeks about your book. And I just want to say thank you very much. Well, thank you, John. You're very uh, intellectual and very religious, and, uh, you know, you're up on your religion, put it like that. Uh, and a very, a very humble, nice, nice fellow. Thank you very much. So, thank you so much. I'm JT Crowley. Thanks for listening. Wherever you're in the world, stay safe until next time. Mm-hmm.